Hi. Hello. It always feels like the holidays sort of sneak up on us. Well, yes, yes. Uh, but here we are <laughs> talking about Christmas. Yeah. And I learned from researching for our time together today that the, the phrase Merry Christmas was actually popularized by Charles Dickens. It was, in so the story story. So let me be the first to say, or perhaps not the first, Merry Christmas. Merry Christmas and, and Happy Thanksgiving. <laughs> yes, Happy even, Thanksgiving. Before we even get to Merry Christmas, Happy Thanksgiving. So you're doing a special version of A Christmas Carol at, it's, at Merchant's House, which we're going to talk about in yes. a little bit. Can you, in a couple of sentences sum up what you're doing and why it's different than other versions of A Christmas Carol we might have seen? Yeah, um, we, we actually developed this. My artistic director, Rhonda Dodd, and I developed this project from the actual acting text or reading text of Charles Dickens. So we went into his reading text and we lifted out the sections that we thought most, um, most uh, exemplified his idea for this story. And then after we had gone through the reading text and we pulled all that out, we went back into the uh, original text, the full length text, and we pulled out some things that he had not included, mm. uh, like ignorance and want, which was sort of interesting since that's really part of the crux of what he was writing about. And when we started writing this in 2012, or when we started adapting this in 2012, um, it was during the 99% and all of the protests that were going on, and we wanted our show to have that point of view to show um, how the 99, how the 1% actually could be changed, how they could be reached. So this was like story. Occupy Christmas Carol. Occupy Christmas <laughs> Carol, I like that. We're gonna do that next year. Okay, We're gonna deal. make the title and we'll give you credit, of <laughs> okay, course. Okay, great. We'll give you credit. <laughs> uh, so you actually play all of the characters. I do. Or do you play Charles Dickens telling the story of all of the characters? I do. Um, you know, uh, it, that's, that idea has grown over the years since we're at the Merchant's House. And the Merchant's House, if you haven't been there, is an amazing place. Um, it is the oldest preserved Victorian home in Manhattan. It's on East 4th Street between Lafayette and Bowery. And if you haven't been there, if, if, even if you don't come see me, you should see the house. But you should, of course, come see me, too. <laughs> um, but uh, it's an incredible place. And, um, but it's, it's uh, I forget, what, I, I lost my train of thought. Where were we? Uh, well, we were talking about what makes your version different. And I asked you about, are you playing Dickens? Or yes. are you well, playing that, all of the characters? That's why I got lost, because we did, we did eventually make it so that he is, it is Dickens telling the story. Since we're in a Victorian home, it just seemed that that marriage was perfect. But when we first started working on it in 2012, we wanted it to be an everyman. So it started out as just an everyman telling the story. And then as we sort of grew into the, uh, into the project and marrying the merchant's house and its Victorian sort of structure and values into the performance, it just made more sense for me to be in a uh, high collar and have a beard, which is coming. Um, I know I'm not follically challenged, so this will actually be coming out. Um, and, uh, and to have a tailcoat and, you know, really make it into something that was married to the house, so. The, the building, the Merchant's House, which is now Merchant's House Museum, was uh, somehow preserved from the mid-1800s, including all of the furniture that the family, the yeah. Treadwell family that lived there, uh, actually used day to day. Um, I, I have heard them say it's not a recreation, uh, it's just still there. Right, and, and I think that Gertrude Chedwell is rumored to actually still be there as well. I heard she um, came to one of your shows. Well, that's what I was told, but she, they also told me she was looking out the window, and I thought, well, if it was really her, wouldn't she have been watching me? This is a woman so, who died uh, 100 years so, yes, ago. She, um, yes, Gertrude Treadwell was the youngest of the Treadwells. She died, I believe, in 1930-something. Uh, that was when she left the house to uh, her one of her nephews, who then turned it over to um, the city and then it became a, a landmark uh, later on in this, in the, it was the first landmarked building in Manhattan after the, uh, the Landmarks Commission was formed. And as far as I know, it's the only one in this area of Manhattan. Yes, um, it is. It's incredibly gorgeous, and yeah. uh, as you said, it should be seen no matter what time of year you go. It's just amazing. Um, but if you go between December 6th and December 24th, then- You get to see me too. Yeah. Absolutely. <laughs> okay, so let's talk about A Christmas Carol. Yes. When 
were you first exposed to the work uh, <laughs> I, in, you know, when you were a kid? Right. Well, I think the first time that I was exposed to it was probably like many of us are. You know, there was a local community production of it. And I went to see A Christmas Carol. And then I really fell in love with that. And then I read the story. And I thought, gosh, the story is so much better than what I actually saw. <laughs> um, but then as I got older and I, as, I became, um, as I became an actor and I started working through the regions, you know, a lot of actors like seek out places that do Christmas Carol if they've had an opportunity to do it before. And you might call them and say, well, you know, I play Fred and uh, I would be glad to come there and do that for you. And do you have other shows that are surrounding that that I could be in in your season? And then you can sort of start to book out your season. Um, so I did it there as well. And I do, well, I love all those productions and I think that they're all, you know, certainly worthwhile. I do think sometimes the bells and whistles that we see in those productions, uh, in this fully staged productions, tend to take away from what Charles Dickens was actually trying to tell us. I mean, this really isn't just about a man who goes from being a bad guy to a good guy. It's about a guy who is exposed to new knowledge or to old knowledge, actually, his childhood, the childhood of people in the present, the childhood of people in the future, and sees how detrimental his own actions have been. So it really is a reawakening. It's not just one day he woke up and decided, oh, I'm gonna be good today. No, he really, he really examined himself. He really examined what his actions were. And I think that that doesn't always make it across in some of the fully staged shows. Yeah, I, I think that what I have lost in seeing productions of A Christmas Carol throughout my life is how political a statement Charles Dickens was making. Child labor laws were very much uh, yes. sort of in the news at that point. And, um, it was actually the reason why he chose to write this piece in the beginning. Um, he decided to write this piece after a, he, there was a huge membership hall meeting. Uh, I think Disraeli, the prime minister at the time of, um, of England was there. And he was thinking about child labor laws and child poverty. And his belief was that education would lift children out of poverty. And I think that's even true today um, when in our own country, um, 15% of our children live in live below the poverty line or live in uh, hunger uh, or food challenged homes. Um, the uh, but yeah, that's the reason why he wrote this, and he wrote it in a matter of six weeks. He decided that something needed to be done, and rather than write a uh, a pamphlet about all the evils that we should be fighting against and all the things that we should be doing, instead of doing that, he wrote something that would touch the heart and that would inform the head. And I think that it does, and I think that it, it, it was a political statement for him. Yeah. It also reestablished him as a great author of his time. He had been waning in his, um, his prowess as an author, and this really brought him back to the forefront. It's hard to believe that Dickens I know. was ever... <laughs> well, yeah. <laughs> well, it's true, but I think that you know when you look at any uh, great author's work or any great painter's work, they can't have masterpieces 100% of the time. Um, I mean, I think we like to ascribe it, you know, that if we have a master, that everything he does is is wonderful. And it may be wonderful, but some pieces are better than others. I hate that idea. <laughs> I love talking about how failure is yes. the only true path to greatness. Absolutely. If you're not failing often, you're not trying hard enough. And so I'm glad to know that he had a, his own moment yes. of darkness. He had to pull himself up. Shakespeare wrote his best works toward the end of his career, and he couldn't have done that without writing, you know... Um, I don't know, Troilus and Cressida. I'm not, not, not my favorite, I'm sorry. Burn. <laughs> um, that actually reminds me of something I know about your personal journey, mm -hmm. which is that throughout the process of developing this piece, which you said you started in, mm -hmm. in 2012, you've actually been working a, a full-time day job. Yeah, um, I have. Um, I think that it's easy to see you up here and <laughs> you know in this fancy production and to, to think you've got it all figured out and you've, you're a Big time oh, uh, theater from, star. From your mouth to God's ear, I, um, I hope. But I'm that. so inspired by the fact that you're going to work every day and yeah. you're still doing this. Yeah, it's, you know, it, especially during the season when I'm doing the show and I'm going to work in the morning and then leaving in the afternoon, going and doing the show in the evening and then going home and getting into bed, waking up, going to, you know, just, it's, a, it's a cycle that you get into. But, um, but you know, theater, I, I, was, uh, I was an actor for 15 years in the regions in the South. And after having really great success there, I thought, let's move to New York. I moved here and never worked again, uh, which is the story for so many actors. So it was a matter of really 
finding work for me to do. And I and I have worked since. I, I I'm being oh yeah, you've performed overly at dramatic. Center and, yes, and all over. Yes, yes, and I have a Geico commercial out there for the uh, for the yes. So, it's it's all uh, me and everybody else. But yes, we have that too. Uh, it was for the um, War and Peace series. So if you're wanting to look it up, <laughs> we're going to YouTube um, it. Yeah. <laughs> but you created this piece. You yes. you took a, a story that's in the public yeah. domain, and is it true that you were performing it in family members' living rooms yes. to, to develop it and make sure <laughs> that it was ready? We performed it in Matchbox apartments. We performed it in families' homes. I performed it in front of a fireplace in my parents' home, which I tell you I will never do again. Performing in front of a fireplace may look really beautiful, but when I got my hug from my aunt after it was over, I just, it was like a sponge. I just, oh. a puddle on the floor around me. Um, so never again, but it was kind of cool, the cracking and the hissing of the fire. But we did do it all in uh, different places. We did it partly because we were in development. We wanted to see where it worked, where it really sang, uh, who was it that really responded to it. Um, I think my favorite story about that, though, is doing it in a room when there were a lot of very young children, and since then we've decided that maybe under the age is, under the age of eight is not so good. Um, but there were young children, and they began to play during the show, and at one point, one of them crawled like right past me, and I was at a particular point where I was talking about family, and I picked him up, and I held him for about a page and a half, and he just sort of hung there as I held him. And then I put him back down, and then he resumed playing again. And actually, it was kind of a cool moment. But at the merchant's house, we discourage crawling on the floor. <laughs> so we don't have that happening there. But it was a lot of fun. But you do have real fire in that room, right? Maybe not a fireplace, but candles? We have, yes, we have candles. And uh, no, no, no fire in the fireplace anymore. But, uh, but we definitely have candles. The fireplaces are gorgeous. They're, they're amazing. But they're not going to heat you but up no, to that point. no, they're not going to heat you up too much. This is a very intimate affair. Only 40 people at any given performance. That's right. A lot of your performances are already sold out. Yes. But you've yes. Added some. We have. We've actually added uh, Tuesday, the December 6th, uh, Tuesday, December the 13th, and Tuesday, December 20th. And uh, we had already sold out, I think, Thursday through Sunday for the first and second week. And um, we're sold out for Thursday and the third week. So at that point, we wanted to be sure that we offered enough uh, opportunities for as many people as possible to come see the show. Um, tickets, by the way, are available at merchantshouse.org, mm -hmm. and you can also read all about the mansion, yes. uh, the museum, and the show there. And summonersensemble.org. Uh, yeah, we that's also, right. That's my theater company, and we also have information about it there, and you can read all our, our wonderful reviews. Tell us about, <laughs> about Summoners a little bit and what your mission is. I understand it's very literature-based. It is. Um, summoners, uh, you know, when it first began in the 90s, it started as a group of uh, actors from Circle in the Square Theater School, and they were... Uh, uh, creating work on their own. Um, it kind of went dormant for a while, and then Rhonda Dodd, who was one of the founding members and is now our artistic director, she took up the mantle, and I came on board as executive director, and we started to, um, we started to decide what our new mission would be. And really, this production of Christmas Carol has informed that mission, uh, lifting literature out of the book and placing it onto the stage. And so that's what we do. We take literature and literally go from page to stage. Uh, this past summer, we actually presented a work called Mississippi Stories. Uh, it was an adapted, two adapted pieces of Eudora Welty works um, by a group in Memphis, in Memphis, uh, Voices of the South Theater Company in Memphis. And they came up, and we were so pleased to be able to present their stage to, or page to stage work of Eudora Welty's piece. And we have some, hopefully, some surprises coming up in the next year for some more page to stage work. So we're looking forward to continuing that mission. That's excellent. Yeah. I want to talk a little bit more about the fact that you are on location in a period specific. It's not a set. It's like a whole world. There are people who say they go into Merchant's House and feel like they've actually stepped back in time. Um, how is this production different? I'm going to phrase it a little bit differently. Okay. Uh, if you were doing the exact same uh -huh. show in a black box theater, would it affect the integrity of the material in a different way? Um, you know, interesting. I, I don't know that it would affect the integrity of the material because when we first went into development, we were actually at the studio theater at Theater Row. So that's in 2012. We did four performances there to see how people would respond to it, if it was a project that was worth developing for us. And we found that it was. Um, I think that the material really sang in that space, but of course it really, um, 
it is really amplified when you're in that Victorian space because it really brings the words and the atmosphere together. I, I couldn't build, I don't think anybody, uh, I, don't, I don't think um, the richest producer could build that set and create that atmosphere. It's just, it's the product of a hundred and, what is that, 80 something years of uh, tradition in that home of maintaining that space. Uh, that's what really gives this, um, gives this piece a real flow. Yeah. I've revisited the text just in the last week or so, and I was surprised at how little of it seemed familiar when I feel like I have seen so many productions of A Christmas Carol. I've seen you know, everything from elementary school productions, professional productions, but also, of course, the Bill Murray movie, Scrooge. Yes. And you know, my first, I think, exposure to the material was the, was the Disney version, Scrooge McDuck. Yes. You know? <laughs> and um, so it just feels like it's kind of everywhere. But I was, I was energized by the fact that the original source material yeah. that you're drawing on mm -hmm feels so different and fresh. I, I think you're right, and I think the biggest compliment that I get every year from many, many people is um, that when they leave and I've told the story and they come up to me and say they've never, they feel like they've never heard the story before, that it feels very fresh and new to them, and that there are parts of the story that they don't think they ever heard before. Mm -hmm. and, and I think that's, uh, that's personally very gratifying, uh, that I'm able to bring that to bear in my performance work. And, and as far as like the past, uh, you know, like Alistair Sims production is mm -hmm. fantastic. And, and I have to say my guilty pleasure is the Muppets version of A Christmas Carol. Oh my it's, gosh, it's of fantastic. course, yes. It's fantastic and, um, and you can watch it as a primer. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, to remind yourself of the story. Uh, yeah, I'm so excited about this production, and, and I think that it really merges sort of uh, on location theater going with a very traditional show, and uh, and I think it's I think it's going to be I agree. really great. I wish yeah. I wish that I could have seen it already, but it doesn't actually open for a, for a couple right. more weeks. That's right. Um, we, we're not until December the sixth. But yeah, it's there's there is something about being on location in a specific place that really brings. Um, an atmosphere that, that can't be generated elsewhere. And, and of course, the other thing, too, that I love about playing in this space, there's really no backstage. And so before the show and after the show, I'm available for the audience. I talk to the audience. I, I help to seat the audience. We have a very small space, as you said. So one of the things that we try to do is place um, our more diminutive audience members toward the center front and our, our larger audience members toward the outside back so that everybody has a really good view. And so I do try to um, seat people, I talk to people, I find out where they're from. Uh, and speaking of which, this year it's amazing. We have people from coming from five different countries and 18 different states. You also um, have people who are coming back for the fourth year in a row. And we have people who are coming back for the fourth year in a row. I have you better so many... keep doing this. You're going to ruin, <laughs> interrupt people's family traditions. Exactly, exactly. I, I, I feel like when I, it, whenever I do stop doing it, which will not be anytime soon, um, I will have to go into hiding. <laughs> so you heard it here first. Or just train a replacement. <laughs> exactly. Um, not that you're replaceable, of course. No, of course. I heard, I heard that you like to seek out the men who look like they're being dragged by their wives. Yes. Oh, that's the, my favorite. Oh, yes. You see the guys come in and their heads are bowed. They've been, they've been told, this is what we're doing tonight. And, well, you know, I'm going to do this. My wife says this. Oh, she bought the ticket, so here we are. Oh, my. And then as I tell the story, it's those very men who, as I'm telling the story, begin to wipe tears away from their eyes and can't speak to me as they leave. And, and they shake my hand and say, thank you, and move out the door. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and again, that's also very gratifying because I think those, I'm not preaching to the choir in that case. These right. are converts. These are people who I hope leave, and if only for an hour, but maybe for a lifetime, that their lives are somewhat changed and that they, that they look at their fellow beings as uh, fellow passengers to the grave and not just a bunch of people on separate journeys. Well, in that case, you're sort of the, the ghost of Christmas present. Yes. They come in a little <laughs> bit scroogey and they leave with a, a warm heart and a yes. 
you know, a proverbial goose. <laughs> well, it, it, I, I do hope that we enhance their holidays. I mean, that we give them that spirit, that we, that we give them the true spirit of Christmas, which is about giving and is about caring for other people, which really, I know it's how cliche and corny it sounds that this should be something that we're uh, aware of throughout the year, but really we need to be aware of it throughout the year. And I think our, our current times inform us that that is true more now than perhaps ever. Certainly, there is no, uh, no lack of need for a reminder to love each other. Exactly. Well, and the fact that, you know, like I said, so many children in our country are living below poverty level. So many children in our country live in homes where food is not a guarantee. And that shouldn't be, not for who we are and what we've been able to accomplish and, and in our country. And I hope this does actually help people when they leave to open up their hearts and their pocketbooks and their minds to uh, new ideas that might uh, offer uh, better lives to our fellow citizens. Well, if that's not the spirit of Christmas, I don't know what is. <laughs> uh, we have time for a few questions from the audience. Fantastic. Hi, how are you? Oh, OK. Don't, you don't have to answer that. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Um, number one, I love The Muppet Christmas Carol. It's like my favorite movie. It's pretty um, good. I was wondering if you have any advice for theater actors in New York City. Yes, just keep going, keep showing up. Um, you know, I was friends with um, uh, Michael Jeter, who uh, some of you may know. He was an actor who was in Grand Hotel here in the city and also in Evening Shade on television. And we both went to uh, the same uh, graduate school. I went to University of Memphis, and he was there also. And he always told me that his success was just a matter of showing up. And so you just have to keep showing up. And sometimes you have to make that opportunity for yourself to show up. And that's what I've done with this piece. Um, and in developing my company, it creates an opportunity for me to continue to work because um, when I chose to be an actor, and I hope that anyone who chooses to be an actor um, chooses to be one because there's nothing else that you'd rather be. And there's nothing else that you can do better. And I feel that, uh, sadly, the second part really does apply to me. And you can ask my people at my job about that, <laughs> um, <laughs> about my career. But, um, but it, 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 I asked myself when I was in undergraduate, I said, you know, if nothing happens, if you, if you end up never being Brad Pitt, or if you never end up being, not even being Michael Jeter or whomever, uh, is it worth it? Is, it? is it still worth it that you devoted your life to this craft? And, for me, I made the decision that it was, and I've stuck by that decision, and nothing has moved me away from it. And I think that as long as you have that and you carry that inside yourself, you'll continue to show up, and you'll continue to make good work, and you'll continue to try to expand and grow. Do we have another question? Yes, hi. Um, as you can tell from my accent, I was kind of brought up on uh, Dickens in school, and. I'm fascinated to see the Victorian house and everything because I actually have a Victorian house in London. That's oh, marvelous. Home. I know. I may be coming to visit you. <laughs> Good, <laughs> you do. Um, I'm curious, do you undertake the accent or? I do, and there's lots of different Wonderful. accents that come out in the piece. So like if I'm doing uh, Bob Cratchit, and he's obviously very working class, and so he has a very sort of guttural sound to it. But then if you're doing, uh, if I'm doing uh, the narrator, he's got a very rich sort of, not quite RP, but it is very rich sounding and, you know, bringing that text in. Um, so yes, I do. And I, I love changing the accents. I try, to, um, I try to make the accent go with the character so that it all sort of uh, comes together. And it does help to delineate characters when you're using accents also, of course. How do the ghosts sound? Um, uh, uh, so, the, and I don't know how well, you know, you'll just have to be a, the judge of my, of my poor attempts, but I do love the Ghost of Christmas Present. Um, come in, come in, and know me better, man. I am the Ghost of Christmas Present. Look upon me. Uh, it's, it's a Sean Connery-esque sort of feel to it, <laughs> so we're going a little bit Welsh with him, um, uh, which I think kind of works. Uh, um, and then, uh, of course, the Ghost of Christmas Past, I try to give him... I mean, he's in the past, and he's tired, <laughs> and he can't quite, you know, bring it together. He's still sort of struggling to fly this man around the city. Mm -hmm. And so we try to give him a little bit of that um, past sound. I, I used um, 
uh, Dumbledore in the Harry Potter <laughs> movies as a, as a guide for that. So yeah, they, um, and then uh, I won't, I don't know if I can do Marley, but he has the, well, he ha I won't, because it's, it's difficult, but you, you'll come and see it. We will. And it's a, um, his, uh, my director calls him rock and roll Marley. He has a hard time breathing. Uh, I'm afraid if I started into it, we, we might be here for a while. <laughs> <laughs> we have time for one more question. Hey, John, do people come up to you after the show and say they didn't realize you were the person seating them? Um, sometimes they do. Sometimes they don't realize that I'm actually the actor, too, which sometimes works, um, a, a, a makes them feel a little strange because, you know, when someone's seating you, it's easy to be dismissive. Oh, yes, yes, I'm sitting here. Yes, yes, I've got it, I've got it, I'm sitting here. And then you get up there and they're like, oh, that's the guy who sat me and that I was sort of dismissive to. Um, it's not a big deal. We quickly make friends again after that. But they don't, sometimes they don't realize that I am, but I try to make it clear that I, that I am the actor in the piece because uh, when we first started developing it, that was one of the things we wanted to do. We wanted to make it not feel like I was on a pulpit or on a, on a high place talking down to every, no, this is really a cross to people. This is really um, on the same level. I want them to feel a personal connection to me because I want them to feel a personal connection to the story. So, yeah. I think that's a, a good opportunity to mention again that this is taking place in an actual parlor of an actual home. There's yes. no stage in this room. Um, Forty people is about the size of yeah. their holiday party when yeah. you know when this family was back having one, Absolutely. and you are in a way the host of that party in this modern era. I want to thank you so much for being here. Oh, Congratulations thank you for on me. another year of this incredible production. <laughs> thank and you so much. And we can't wait to come and see it. Terrific! Thank I can't you. wait to see you there, and you as well. Thanks again. And Merry Christmas. Merry Christmas.